Heinz, maybe you can start by telling us how this film uh, emerged from the lobby. Um, you said in your introduction that this is a film about a man who wants to die but fails to, and the lobby's also pretty preoccupied yeah, with death. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, in the lobby, only John Erdman acted, and at, at one point he said to me, I really would like to do a film staying in bed, and I said, well, I will write one. <laughs> Uh, well, and I, then uh, another motive of this film. I at one point I really wanted to interrupt a so-called narrative movie by the camera person telling her side, <laughs> because usually they are not uh, asked what they think about the whole game, and I thought. Uh, we should do it really properly and having having her a long monologue that <laughs> destroys everything that you uh, <laughs> uh, wait for in a movie. <laughs> uh, well, on the topic of John requesting to be in a film where he's in bed, do you, I mean, you talked about you know the lobby as a space interesting you as a transitional area. Do, do you see the bedroom as that as well? Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, my hobby is sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, y you've, talked, you've talked about the, the writing process yes. uh, happening pretty quickly for you. Once you start, you, you finish a script pretty, pretty uh, soon. No, as not case? in this case. I mean, uh, it was, uh, the lobby was written in 15 days and <coughs> shot in 15 days, but here we worked for at least a year. I worked with John, we rehearsed, we cut pieces out, we I included more pieces. And then before Claudio uh, and, and uh, you invited me uh, to do this uh, film in Mexico. They said, uh, we give you 12 days of shooting. And then I thought, well, and I think they expected an architecture film, but they said the only condition is that the film has to be longer than 60 minutes. And I said, well, no problem. <laughs> so I, I thought this is a fantastic way of producing, of, uh, having producers, so they trusted me. They didn't know what else I was doing. They looked at it, uh, but then they can tell what they think about it. But uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, it was just, I was asking you if you thought of the bedroom as a, as a transition. Well, oh, but then in, into your writing process as well. Uh, the, um, yes, uh, uh, yeah, it was a longer writing process over this year. And then after Claudio asked me uh, to, uh, I thought I wanted to uh, do the uh, future in uh, actually in El Alto in Bolivia, and but then uh, I this film had no money at all. The, the, we we didn't get funding. For, I, I don't get funding because I'm too old and. Uh, they don't trust old people anymore. And they fund more or less only first films and then let people alone. But uh, so we, uh, we, we funded it ourselves. So we were not under pressure to do it in a certain amount of time. So actually, I wrote the Mexican part, I think, after. No, it was written already, parts of the conversation he has. Uh, uh, I I I, uh, I wrote before, but then after the invitation, I wrote Mexican part. And when I saw how good Susanna, the camera person, is, I thought, oh, I should take her to Mexico too because she has to reappear in the future. So this is a process and not uh, worked out before we started shooting. What it it was decided during the work. Yeah, uh, I do want to get back to the writing process, but Claudio and Julian, um, I am curious, what was your, you know, impression of the final film? Yeah, uh, yeah. When I, I, I met the Heinz Hemigols at the 2011 at the Riviera Maya Film Festival. I was uh, one of the programmers there at the Riviera Maya Film Festival. And before I, I watched his films, his architecture films, and I was like really amazed through that kind of filmmaking. I think Heinz Hemigols is one of the 
best uh, filmmakers trying to capture space and time through architecture and through that kind of, of films. He's a unique uh, filmmaker. As a producer, I want to do films or make films with uh, mavericks like Heinz Hemigels or people who wants to make films in different kind of production sh schemes and that, ca that, that kind of things. And then Julian and I, we uh, start a production company trying to do these things and travel to Germany, to Berlin. Uh, and, and, and there we uh, ask to Heinz Hemigels to produce a film about architecture because we are trying to make a, a short about uh, Barragan and that kind of, uh, of architectures in, in, in Mexi Mexican uh, architectures. But Heinz has a long history behind with, with Barragan and he stopped us quickly and said, no, we, I don't want to shoot any more Barragan, but we want to, I want to make a, a film, a future film in Bolivia. And I said, no, let's do this, not in Bolivia, instead in Mexico City. And that's when the suit starts in, in our relation, trying to make this uh, apocalyptic uh, sci-fi comic and, and great uh, film. Uh, and we made this film at a house that uh, Julian has in, in, in Mexico. And uh, yes, and Heinz Hemigols were living with John Ehrman and Jonathan Perel almost like a month in, Me in Mexico. In the in the middle of a chaotic retrospective in Mexico City, all, with all the, his his films, and then start the pre-production there in Mexico, and then the shooting for 11 or 12 to 15 days. We have a really nice time there in in Mexico with a crew, an amazing crew, because we shoot with a lot of uh, young uh, people there. Uh, a, a lot of uh, students or almost like a grad graduated uh, filmmaker. So was really great make films with uh, experienced people and renowned filmmakers as Hans Emigos, but also with a really young crew as the sound recordist, the uh, line producers, the uh, camera assistants. And I think that kind of mixing are the future of, of, of making cinema because it's able to make cinema in the margins of the industry and making these great uh, films like, uh, like this one with people that really understand how a filmmaker as Heinz Hemigos has in his mind and his vision with other filmmakers, young filmmakers that wants to make films not for uh, making money or not for, yeah, they want to make films for the experience and the vision, because they have, uh, yes, uh, young visions, yeah. Did you want anything? Well, well, yes, uh, well, first, uh, thank you for coming, and also thank you for the invitation on the festival. Um, I saw the films or, of Haynes uh, before Claudio was uh, telling me, and I thought that when he came to Mexico, he was going to shoot some architecture, folkloric, or some colorful. And then it was amazing, you know, to see him how this uh, uh, taking a decision where to shoot to these devastated places that were so beautiful, you know, uh, and. And his vision was uh, wonderful. The, the, the humor, uh, I, I think all this combination is, is, is incredible art. Uh, and, and I'm so grateful to meet him and to work with, with an artist like him, you know? Hi. Uh, the team was fantastic, I must say. Uh, we worked with, yeah. There are these three books that form kind of guide points throughout the Book of Chinese Drawings, the Edgar Allan Poe poems, uh, Anatomy of Melancholy. Uh, can you tell us how these books found their, their way into the film? Because they are my three favorite books, and uh, they are actually staying at my bedside. Uh, we filmed in my bedroom because we didn't have money for a studio. <laughs> so the books are there and I decided these three books uh, represent something because we, they came from s three dear friends from Martin Langbein, from uh, David Larcher, the filmmaker, and from Uwe Nettelbeck, a wonderful German writer who was a friend of mine. 
and all of them are dead. So for me, it's important to make a little monument within destroying the narrative or something, but showing something that I really liked. Yeah, it's very positive, I would say. Yeah, I think, yeah. mm. There's well, there's also like a, there's a fourth book that your your film the what book a fourth book that your film is dedicated to at the end with the Philip K. Dick. No, book. Philip K. Dick, uh, I knew, uh, and he sent me this uh, shortly before he died. He sent me a book of his, and he wrote into ein uh, guter Freund, uh, live wohl, Heinz, which means a good friend, uh, live well, Philip. Yeah? So he, and I read, uh, I, I, read all his books, I, uh, uh, and you see them in, in, uh, on the board, uh, all 36 novels or 38, what he wrote uh, on the board over the bed. So Philip K. Dick loved uh, 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 comics, and I do drawings a little bit in a comic style. So that's why he knew my work, and so I got in contact with him. Uh, we can start taking some audience questions. Any? Yep, in the back. We'll have a mic come to you. Um, or I can just shout. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the the jacket uh, that was deconstructed um, that he wore and changed. Uh, what what's the reason for that? And and the. Uh, Actually, it was not deconstructed. I have a tailor. It was made in Gozo in Malta, and I asked at my tailor, please do me a jacket that is half finished. So it was <laughs> constructed, but only halfway. And for me in the future, well, to say the obvious is there are not really any uh, customs. Uh, no, no, no. What? Uh, workers like that anymore. You get, um, he is a very old man. I think he's the last tailor on Gozo. And then you can buy uh, them at Zara or M&M, uh, much cheaper. So uh, it's a kind of, uh, uh, yeah, un the unfinished, unfinishedness of it. Uh, I I was intrigued to that. And so it goes through the whole film, so it's right to get the title. Yeah. We have a microphone now. Craftsmanship, I meant. Yeah? yeah. Hardly any craftsmanship is left and in our so-called developed countries, and this is just a terrible thing. Uh, thank you for that wonderful movie. Um, my question's about the credits. I'm not yeah. used to watching credits. I mean, you know, we don't pay attention to them. But then the name, a few names flashed by, among which uh, Walter Benjamin. And I'm just wondering, what did I see? What was there? Uh, Walter Benjamin is that, that last piece, A Woman at Night, uh, says, the, and it's actually a poem by him about Karl Kraus. And Karl Kraus uh, appears in two pieces there too in that film and Walter Benjamin this poem about Karl Kraus the lost ones it's called and you uh, when you can see on my website you on my uh, you will find the whole uh, you can read which yeah. poems I use I you only used poems before uh, World War one and then the Walter Benjamin thing from uh, 31 so uh, this all is if these poems, finding these poems is a fruit of because I, I had a I had a project to read all uh, issues of his magazine De Fackel, the Torch. That's twenty two thousand pages. I read them all, and I must say I learned so much than never before. So I I stuck in that time, especially. The time before World War One is for me uh, uh, the time you have to study to find out why everything 
goes down the drain now. I mean, in my family, for example, my grandfathers died in World War I. So the, the, family, the families were destroyed, and then uh, the Hitler arrived. Uh, arisal of Hitler and the Second World War is just an outcome of the First World War. So uh, this is uh, so my uh, agenda to go into these historical realms and I think I will yeah, continue with that. Your question was different. I remember something different. What was <laughs> it? <laughs> I'm starting to tell Can stories you're, that you're you don't want to hear. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I you're, you're I weaving together question. lines from many other texts, not just yeah, uh, uh, no, about five poems. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yeah. he is reciting the German poems, and then they. Uh, rehearse the one poem for a second time together with Susanna. So five poems, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I have another question. Uh, the woman who was the scribe, very interesting character, and, and how did she come into being? And then she fell asleep on us. <laughs> what? The, the, the scribe, the woman who wrote? Yes, she, she's a camera woman, and then she has to slave for him uh, and, and write this ridiculous love letter, yes, and then she falls asleep about it, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, How I, does she come into the picture? Yes. She works for him, and she does, it seems like she on, not only did the camera, but uh, did uh, uh, wrote down his letters that he dictated, and... <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't about. do it with much purpose. What? Uh, the, um, <laughs> she was not so purposeful in, in capturing his, uh, his words or thought. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and then you know what happened in the forest, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned John uh, wanting to be filmed in a bed, but in the film he's also talking about how good he looked in this suit in the lobby. Was this yes. actually an, a, a conversation <laughs> that you had about this? No. I mean, you, uh, no, no, John is an actor and not, I don't, I didn't make a film about John. I mean, it just uh, th that he, uh, uh, the words there that are mine, and, but the idea, let's do a film where the main actor stays in bed all the time, was quite intriguing for me to, as a kind of task, how would I do it, yeah? <laughs> so when, I, and when you film architecture too, uh, how do you film it? But a bed is just a simple thing and you, you have to find a million ways to film a bed and this was a, a task for me, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the way you um, frame and you break up your shots, and in this film, you're often uh, splitting up spoken lines within a sentence, um, and it just gets me back to thinking about what you said in the introduction, introduction about someone wanting to die, but failing to die, but also the way you're cutting this film in terms of the lines spoken, it's sort of interrupting again, this idea of interrup interruptions and just interrupting, uh, I guess, the main character's uh, desire to have any kind of discourse. I uh, I have one rule when I do the camera. I never cut back into a shot that I sh showed before because usually when you have a dialogue, you have these three shots, one over the shoulder and one to him, one to her, and over the shoulder, and then goes back and back and forth. And I think this is cheating to the extreme. Every time I see something like that, I, I feel cheated. And uh, because I know exactly they did this one take, and then the second take, and then the third take, and then they had the whole run. If I would do that, you would die by boredom. You know, I, I, uh, I, I use one shot, and then I, I screw myself into the situation. You know, and this is what I. This is why I do camera myself too. I don't have to talk to a camera person to, 
uh, convince him to do a good shot. Uh, we are very fast because uh, I love to do it. And then uh, we come up with this. And this is, I, I, the reason is I want you not to know what is the next shot. When you do this A, B over the shoulder, C, A, B, A, B, C, A, B, and this kind of bullshit, then you know exactly what kind of shot. And I really believe in the integrity of uh, composing uh, different images, always different images, and nobody knows where it goes to. And the whole film uh, is a kind of ride where you don't know where you end up. Does she now speak for 60 minutes about camera? No. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and then some, yeah. It's, uh, uh, and I have a certain, uh, I want that you really listen to what is said. So we do very careful sound work. So that the, the cutting, that the level of uh, speech or language is always on one level. So you, you can really understand, but you see the different viewpoints. I want the camera being really a protagonist in that play, yeah? and not something that you should forget or identify with. I don't believe in this stupid theory, the camera is the eye, this is literally bullshit. You know, the camera is not the eye. And uh, uh, yeah, so the camera is there undoubtedly and it k keeps you out of, maybe it, it distracts you from a certain way of looking at him. He always plays to the camera, and then I do shots with the same text from both sides, so I see him, how he looks into the direction of the camera. So it's a kind of um, reconstructing the space around him, yeah? And, uh, yeah. How long does it take to edit? To do what? To edit the film. Oh, not very long. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we start with, I always edit where, I'm, uh, where I think this has to be like that, and what, what is not so clear, I leave out. So we started maybe with the books, uh, which is totally clear, it has to be like that. And then we edit scenes, but in this way, I had a script then at the end, so we edited long script yeah yeah um we're out of time but if there is one last question we can take it right to uh, can you just talk about your comedic influences because there's so much of the movie that is funny right uh, uh i like that you say that because uh <laughs> i said i sh maybe i should make money by stand up <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I don't make money with film, you know. <laughs> Yesterday I saw uh, Megalopolis, <laughs> and they call it Megaflopolis or something. <laughs> and I thought this is such a sad movie, uh, kitschy, and it didn't work. But so it was a 140 million flop. So my advertisement is now I can do a flop for 30. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Okay, we have to wrap it up at Heinz. Thank you so much, Claudia Jones. Thank you. Thank you.